You know, I, I, I never met a meteorologist until I came to Gaithersburg. Okay, and uh, the, the, the ones I know, we have some, actually we're on the, have been up here this morning already. Uh, they have good senses of humor, which uh, I, fi- I find amusing in itself. But uh, meteorologists, you know, they're the people who deal with the weather. They uh, give us a heads up on storms or changes that are likely going to occur around the bend. Uh, I, I have learned loud and clear in the time I've been here, though, their meteorologists are the ones who help give pilots a sense of the conditions they're likely to encounter, so therefore it's kind of important to have them around. They help paint a picture of what could ha- happen in the coming days. They help get us a bit prepared. Uh, are they always 100% correct? Judd, no, of course not, but we still, we still pay attention to them and pay attention to what they have to say. In this area, we know if they, if they say there's a 90 or 100% chance of a storm, we know the whole metropolitan area goes to Safeway or Giant to make sure they have bread, milk, and eggs so they can make French toast till Jesus returns. Think about what is a storm, though. A storm, when we think of the word storm, generally we are thinking about something severe, something way beyond normal. We usually seek cover when a storm is coming. It disrupts the status quo quite profoundly. It's marked by a radical change. Think about wind, rain, snow, sleet, hail, thunder, lightning. You combine several of those variables together, you realize it's a, it's a tough recipe that can cause great damage and ca- can instill great fear in people. You know, in today's text, uh, Jesus pretty much, in my opinion, is saying there's a 100%, 100% chance of storm coming our way in this life. Not literal storms, but spiritual, emotional, cultural storms coming at us. And that image would have, I think, resonated with Jesus' first listeners because if you think about them, most of them were exceedingly poor. They lived hard lives. This Roman Empire was the occupying force all around them. They were occupying force in the land. They were heavily taxed. They were constantly being put in their place, in a sense, pounded by the storm. We can relate to that image here in uh, 2013 because we all face many storms in life, things that try and derail us, things that keep us occupied, things that keep us occupied and ignoring what is most important. We have outside stresses. We have choices that we make, choices that we ourselves make that don't bring us peace but rather stress us out and fill us with anxiety, in a sense, stir up an inner storm. We have to say, as we read the text, what is Jesus' response to a storm? His response is pretty clear. Follow my way. Live by my words. Do what I teach, and I will lead you through that storm. You will be prepared. Indeed, you'll be prepared, he promises. So what we want to do this morning is just take a a quick look at Jesus the teacher. You know, in in the first century... uh, If you were uh, interested in uh, following a rabbi, following a teacher, what you would do is you, would, as a student, would seek them out. You'd go up to them and say, can I I be your student? And they would say, yay or nay. But you were the one who sought them out. Jesus was uh, different. He didn't necessarily wait for people. He would go out, walk along the seashore, and call people to be his students. He invited them to, uh, to be his pupils, to see the world differently as he taught. And if you think about it, Jesus as a teacher wasn't about giving fact after fact after fact as if facts change our life. Jesus told stories to draw people in. He would tell a story, and in your head, mentally, what you would, he would, be say, you would be saying is, who am I in this story? Which character am I? He would uh, use metaphors. He would give quick-witted one-liners. He would... Uh, flip an old saying that everyone know, he would flip it upside down and say, look at it from a different angle. He would use images that people could easily remember and recall easily. But in a nutshell, what we have to see is what he was teaching was the way. They'd often refer to it as the way or the way 
to live. You know, the text today really is, it's at the very end. It's the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 through 7 is this uh, long extended teaching. Uh, St. Augustine was the one who labeled it as the Sermon on the Mount, but really it was just a, uh, uh, probably a, a series of uh, series of things Jesus would have taught over and over and over again. Uh, Penny's going to put a picture up here. That's uh, traditionally where they believe the, Jesus taught a lot, the Mount of Beatitudes. It's a beautiful place on the north part of the Sea of Galilee uh, where he would have taught the masses. It's a pretty, actually a fairly hilly slope, but it's a, it's a beautiful place. And when you're there, uh, when I first began that we were there for a worship service uh, in January, and they, they started the beginning reading the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are persecuted. In Israel, that was probably the spot where, for some reason, I just started weeping. Because you got the sense that, wow, what he was talking about was radically different from what we hear every day of our life. And what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount was... Your status in the world has nothing to do with uh, your money, your possessions, who you, uh, what family you were born into, what race you are. You are precious for who you are. Jesus says the people who are blessed are those who mourn, the peacemakers, those who show mercy. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted. Totally different perspective on life. He gave people an image of who they were supposed to be in this message. He said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He was saying Christians are people who should add flavor to the world. You should enrich it. Light of the world means, yeah, we, we're surrounded by darkness, but we are the people who are supposed to show others. He said, don't do things for show. Be a person of integrity. He said, when you speak to God, speak directly. Don't beat around the bush. Ask for what you need. He uh, says, like, you know, the, one, one of my favorite parts of the sermon is, he, uh, he's like a trainer who's training someone to, uh, an athlete who's a high jumper. Okay, you picture that, where you have to leap over a bar. You know, Jesus says, uh, you have heard it said, uh, don't murder. That's a pretty low bar, if you, in my opinion. Most of us, are, we can pretty much leap over that. We're not going to murder anyone. But what Jesus says is, don't even hate. Raises the bar a lot higher, saying if, and a lot of us, we have that issue of there are people who annoy us. Hatred is in the heart. That's a much more difficult thing. But Jesus says, focus on that. He says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's a pretty low bar. It's pretty easy to, it's, uh, pretty easy to like the people you like but, uh, and, and hate the people you don't like. But Jesus says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Martin Luther King said that all the time, but that's a much, much higher bar, a much more important thing to focus on. Jesus taught, don't judge others. He said, uh, when you see, a, you see the speck in another person's eye, you see their tiny flaws, but what Jesus says is, you're not paying attention to yourself. You have a huge log in your own eye. Jesus says, fix yourself first before you even pay any attention to another person. He says, don't worry about accumulating tons of stuff. Don't worry about your next meal. Even the birds of the air are cared for. As God cares for them, he'll care for you as well. Jesus taught all those things and many, many more that I haven't even mentioned. But he says, this is the plan. This is who I want you to be. I want you to carry out this plan. I want you to live this way. Build on that foundation. Build on that way, and you will weather any storm. What he said in the text is that you ignore those things I've taught, and you'll be like a house built on sinking sand. Think about how different our lives would be if we fully embraced Jesus' way. Uh, Just pick out a few of those things. A few of those things. What if we regularly spoke to God about our true needs instead of our wants? Okay, I'm like the next person. I want to get the iPhone 5. Okay, I think about that periodically. A lot of us think about the next purchase or the next experience in this life, but sometimes that keeps us from focusing on the deeper things of life, like, God, can you help me to be more forgiving? Can you help me to be more patient? Can you, can you help me to give more time to people who need my time? If we prayed that way, do you think it would make a difference in this life? I think it would make a huge difference. What if we tried to focus on not judging others and actually 
told, another, told some other people, that this is who I want to be. Hold me accountable to that. Ask me, how am I doing with that? How am I, am I being more gracious in daily life? Am I seeing the best in others? Am I showing gratitude for what God has put in front of me? We know all or have difficult people put in front of us. We can lament and moan about that, but if we had another person saying, boy, you are the person that, you're, you're the person God put in front of that other person to make a difference. Uh, what if we uh, worried about ourselves less? What if we gave more? What if we cared for the needs of others, as Jesus suggests? Would we still be taken care of? Would we still be taken care of? I know the answer is yes. I am pretty sure that if we truly follow Jesus' way in this life, it would open a door to seeing the world totally different. We would experience the world totally different. The people around us would be transformed and lifted up in a way that is not possible without the presence and spirit of God. You know, often I get the sense that I have begun to see the door opened by Jesus. He's invited me in, but I've not yet fully walked through. He's waiting for me to walk deeper on that journey, deeper into the way. And I think that's probably true of all of us. We've heard Jesus calling. We know that there's a better way for all of us out there. And Jesus doesn't lament that we haven't fully walked through. He simply says, follow me, follow my way. You're always invited. Step on in. Amen.